for joining us for our sixth episode, which is on mending a broken heart, managing heart failure. So the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology, in collaboration with the European Examination in Core Cardiology, presents to you this Core Cardiology Review Series, which is a webinar series designed to provide comprehensive updates on various core cardiology topics. It also serves as a good preparatory course for cardiologists in the Asia-Pacific region planning to embark on the EECC examination. So I'll be chairing today's session with a good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Julian Kenrick Lowe from uh, National Heart Centre of Singapore. And with us today, we have two wonderful speakers. Our first, Dr. Novi Antisari from Indonesia, who will be talking about monitoring and heart failure, followed by Dr. Derek Lee Pohim from Hong Kong, who will be talking about comorbidities in heart failure. A few disclaimers and housekeeping rules. Uh, the content of this webinar is copyrighted by the APSC. The views and opinions expressed are those of the faculty members and do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. This webinar is live streamed via the APSC Facebook page and also YouTube pages. Uh, CME points will be submitted for those who are connected throughout the whole duration of the webinar series. And you will receive your certificate of attendance upon completing a survey sent via email post webinar. Feel free to engage with us as well throughout this uh, particular episode via the Q&A chat box. A bit of shameless advertising on our side. Our next episode, episode 7, will be on the 13th of March, 2024. And it will be a bit of a potpourri of topics under cardiology, including channelopathies, pericardial and myocardial diseases, and CBD and non-cardiac surgery. So without further ado, let's get started. And our first speaker will be Novi Antisari from Indonesia, and she'll be talking about monitoring and heart failure. Dr. Novi, uh, if you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Th thanks, Esmond. Uh, let me share my screen for a while. Okay. Is my slide uh, seen views correctly? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. First, I'd like to say thank you for the APC committee for giving me the opportunities to uh, talk about heart failure as part of our EECC review series. I'm grateful to be here with all of my opas, Esman, Julian, and Derek. So I was given, uh, actually, I was given a difficult task to talk about all the monitoring in heart failure, which I'll try my best to summarize all of them within 20 minutes. So first, when it comes to heart failure, there are a lot of things that we as physicians have to look out for. I'll categorize the key points into five things. First, the, mon the monitoring for decongestion and urine output. Secondly, monitoring for BNP and biomarkers, followed by monitoring for GDMT, prescription, up titration, and side effects. And then hemodynamic monitoring, and lastly, monitoring for the progression of the disease. As we all know that in patients with heart failure, the presence of the congestion from sign and symptoms and elevated PCW WP were all associated with higher mortality, as we see here from the pre previous studies done by Lucas et al. from American Heart Journal in the year 2000 and by Greg Fonaro in circulation in 1994, which means congestion is bad and we should for, first and foremost decongest the patient ASAP in the case of acute decompensated heart failure. So as we know, um, based on the current ESC guidelines, um, diuretics are recommended in all spectrum of heart failure in the presence of congestion to alleviate symptoms. And it's actually a class one recommendation for the congestion in all heart failure subgroups. Just to refresh a bit, this graph summarizes the signs and symptoms of congestion that we should look out for in heart failure patients. This includes signs of orthopnea, elevated JVP, hepatomegaly, peripheral congestion, elevated biomarkers, um, positive chest X-ray, and ultrasounds. And before initiating the congestive therapy in acutely decompensated heart failure patient, we really should make sure that our patient is uh, really congested or not. Now the question is how to decongest and which drugs to use. So there are hundreds of studies done previously and we already know that loop diuretics is the backbone of diuretic therapy in, in acute heart failure being used in over 90% 90, um, 90 of patients. And based on the previous study published in AEGM, loop diuretics um, inhibit the sodium, uh, sodium potassium chloride transporter NKCC2 at the apical surface of thick ascending limb in the loop of handler. So in our nephrons, there are several sites and mode of actions uh, which affects on sodium reabsorption in the nephron on different diuretics. So, um, so 
uh, first we know that um, you can see here 65% uh, of sodium reabsorption done in the proximal convoluted tubules. And the first agent is carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, which is acetazolamide, which inhibits sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule. Then followed the, our current new favorite, SGLT2 inhibitors, also inhibit proximal sodium absorption. Second part is in the loop, uh, is the loop diuretics, which we as previously mentioned, followed by 5% uh, um, sodium reabsorption at the early distal convoluted tubules, which um, uh, which uh, mainly thiazide work here, and followed by MRA mainly works at the end of the distal complete tubule, and finally phosphopressin antagonists which limit distal nephron free water reuptake by counteracting arginine phosphopressin, which resulted in a limited availability availability of luminal aquaporin water channel in the renal collecting ducts. This result in increased aquaresis without significantly impacting natriuretic response. So based on the position statement by ESC guidelines, we use this algorithm to help us achieve target decongestion, which first uh, IV patients, uh, we need to find whether our patients are naive to look diuretics previously or not. And um, if not, then we should start the IP look diuretics in two times home dose. So this uh, statement was come from the previous study, which is dose trial. Why was given two and a half oral dose? Because the oral dose trial where they randomize high dose of IP bolus and continue to IP infusion, two times of the oral dose from the patient, uh, dose of uh, that patient taken previously, previously at home. Um, they found that there is no benefit uh, for primary endpoint for of patient global assessment, but the patient fast, uh, the patient was reported to be decongest faster and achieve target dry weight faster than lowered loose, uh, lower dose of loop diuretics. And then we should uh, monitor the spot urinary sodium, which is uh, more than 50 to 70 mg per liter, or to assess urine, uh, urine output, which is uh, the target is more than 100 to 150 milliliter per hour. Um, which this method actually um, was backed by the current INEC HF trial. So the INEC HF trial was previously presented at the, at the last HFA Congress in 2023, for which they evaluate the dose of diuretics based on urine output and urinary sodium. So it's open label, non-randomized PCT, two phases. Um, they found that by using standardized diuretic protocol in acute heart failure, uh, using, I mean, using a standardized diuretic protocol in acute heart failure using uh, to evaluate uh, naturalistic and diuresis, they found that um, it increased naturalistic up to 64% on the first day, increased diuresis and also will decrease length of stay. And then we could double the IV diuretic dose if needed. And we also can use a combination therapy, which include thiazides, azetazolomide, amylorides, or uh, uh, tolpeptans and SGLT2 inhibitors. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So the the first trial that uh, include azetazolomide was at board trial to evaluate the use of azetazolomide in heart failure, which they found an increase of the congestion up to forty six percent on the first three days of hospitalization and a 0 0.5 liter more diuresis and 60, uh, 98 millimole uh, more naturesis in ARVO trial. Followed by there are a trial to include hydroclotizide in heart failure, which is clotic trial. They found that in 72 hours, the subject showed more uh, weight loss and increase uh, in diuresis on the first 24 hours, but there is no difference in dyspnea and there is also noted a worsening in kidney function as well. The third will be Athena for the use of high dose MRA in acute heart failure, which done by uh, Javed Butler et al. in 2017. Uh, but this study uh, was uh, actually was neutral though, while well, they found no difference in BNP congestion and or clinical outcomes by using a high dose MRA in acute heart failure. Okay, and lastly, uh, the algorithm showed that we can use a UF as a bailout if persistent congestion.
Okay, and then we come for the monitoring for biomarkers. When it comes to monitoring for biomarkers, there are several biomarkers that have been tested and can be loosely arranged into the following categories. First, which is a myocardial stress or, in, or injury uh, with the famous antiproben B antroponin, and then neurohormonal activation, remodeling, and comorbidities. So, however, in this session, we will focus more on the use of anti-pro-BNP because, as we know, the BNP and anti-pro-BNP are considered to be benchmarks against which other biomarkers are compared. So, why the use of uh, BNP and anti-pro-BNP? Because they are sensitive and specific for the clinical diagnosis of heart failure. They are useful for prognostication. They are useful in cases where clinical diagnosis in, in, is uncertain and provided additive information. And BNP useful in all spectrum of, of heart failure, and they already validated cutoff values for use in diagnosis and the use for prognosis as well. And then the information from the prior trials is available regarding the effect of certain therapies on their concentration. And there, I can't say that BNP is inexpensive, but they are reproducible and uh, uh, most reliable at the moment. So there are studies that use uh, anti pro BNP to guide therapy in heart failure. First, it a guide uh, it uh, HF guided trial. However, uh, this patient um, in guided trial, the patient was randomized um, to either an anti pro BNP guided strategy versus usual care. So, um, however, they find that a high risk patient with half breath, a strategy of guiding therapy based on concentration of anti pro BNP was not more effective than a usual care strategy in reducing the composite endpoint um, time to first heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death. Now covering for both monitoring of anti pro BNP, the optimization of the therapy in heart failure, we could never complete without looking through the strong HF trial, which published in 2022. So based on both ACC and EAC guidelines, all patients with heart failure should be carefully evaluated and to optimize all our treatment and to do early follow-up visit post-discharge. And also we can see here from the latest uh, heart failure, focus update of heart failure, uh, ESC 2022 guidelines, which is class 1B. So in strong HF trials, um, patient with uh, acute decompensated heart failure admission, both randomized to usual care and high intensity arm, for which in the high intensity arm, the medication was optimized intensively with closer monitoring for labs and clinic visits. We can see here that during the exploratory endpoints analysis, the primary endpoint, we can see here that is a markedly 180-day all-cost death um, deduced compared to the usual care. And then also the clinical sign of heart failure and, and decrease in anti pro BNP also was favored in the level of, uh, in the intervention arm. So in the strong HF, there are 41% um, uh, adverse event in uh, high intensity group versus usual care group, uh, which they found is 15% with heart failure in high intensity compared to the, the usual care. Hypotension uh, also uh, more prominent in high intensity group versus usual care because they increase the dose, they uptake the dose more intensively. And then also hyperkalemia was uh, found at 3% compared to 0% in usual care group. Renal impairment also more slightly more prominent in the high intensity. And then while the when it comes to the serious adverse event, they're not much different for both uh, for both arms. Uh, while in fatal, also there's no difference. So what's the difference between guide uh, it versus strong HF uh, study? We can see that in guide it study, patient in with anti pro BNP guided therapy, intensification and control actually received very similar care during the study, including the similar dose of GDMT. Hence, differing the outcomes unlikely to be uh, unlikely to be seen. While in strong HF, you can see here that the patient uh, in the, the, the strong HF, uh, the, the intervention arm was given an early application of drugs to, to, to see clinical outcomes. And then we see the hemodynamic monitoring in heart failure. So what is the rationale of hemodynamic monitoring? Um, the goal actually for a remote monitoring in heart failure actually is to estimate changes in volume status to monitor deterioration of heart failure and in turn to identify and to avoid impending heart failure related hospitalization through timely interventions. So as we know that traditional approaches such as symptom assessment, weight changes and biomarkers 
it's lacks of sensitivity and sometimes are poorly, to, poorly correlated with intracardiac feeling pressures. And then they often fail to detect um, impending heart failure episodes in a timely manner. Also, it's difficult sometimes when we ask if the patient having uh, increase in um, his body weight, uh, we need to really sometimes ask the patient, we don't know whether the patient having an increased body weight because of water retention or because he just like eating too much and become more fatter. Hence, there are several trials um, to find the use of implantable uh, monitoring device to catch an impending heart failure, such as a cardio MIMS device. And um, there are also several studies, which is a champion study uh, done in 2017. They, um, they find that the, there is a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure with the use of implantable PAPAP monitor. And then also the second would be the guide HF uh, trial. This trial actually, um, however, yielded a neutral result um, uh, where it's actually said that hemodynamically guided heart failure management may also reduce heart failure hospitalization in the patient with earlier stage of heart failure. And then lastly, the monitor HF study, which is the first study to demonstrate an improved quality of life and functional status associated with remote invasive monitoring, uh, invasive hemodynamic monitoring using cardio MIMS in HF irrespective of LVEF. So currently, as of the overall guideline, uh, the overall guidelines, the current H American HF guidelines actually assign the remote invasive hemodynamic monitoring as a class two B recommendation. So in addition to hemodynamic monitoring in heart failure, we all, all know about the ESCAPE trial that was negative. And actually followed that, followed by that, the Cooper et al. from Duke, Duke did a study using ESCAPE trial data to examine characteristics and outcomes of patients with invasive hemodynamic monitoring during an acute heart failure hospitalization. So actually in this study, it's quite interesting where they found that the final wedge pressure and RA pressure but not final cardiac index actually were associated with the uh, worst clinical outcomes. However, there are some limitations in this study where uh, in ESCAPE trial, the patient deemed too sick or too well were not included. And then uh, treatment strategies were not specified in the trial. While we know that all centers participating in the ESCAPE trial were all experienced in the management of advanced heart failure and acute heart failure, patient may have diff received different treatments for similar hemodynamic profiles. So there's no like uh, validating uh, the, the treatment for this kind of patient. And then the treatment options for advanced heart failure populations has changed in the time period between the escape trial and this analysis, specifically with the increased use of durable MCS devices. Um, at this point of time, only class one indication listed in any society guideline for PA catheter use is during the evaluation for cardiac transplantation candidacy by the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant Guidelines. Um, also, uh, additional study by Mandrit Kanwar et al. revealed that the use uh, for of PA catheter associated with the decrease in hospital mortality, especially if performed within six hours of hospital admission. And they also find that uh, during the group risk of in, 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 his portal, in hospital mortality, they find that the lower, uh, it's actually lower when PAC was placed within versus, uh, versus uh, after six hours of patient admission. So there are four things that is useful in treating heart failure patients, especially in wet and cold situation. So I, uh, so first is the value of PAC is to determine the hemodynamic profile and classification of cardiogenic shock. Uh, and then also PAC guided management, escalation of MCS or durable MCS, also for evaluation for uh, heart, uh, heart transplant candidacy. So this table summarizes all parameters to differentiate which subtype of cardiogenic shock our patient is currently in. So we can see here all these hemodynamic variables that we get by um, putting in a PA catheter from the CVP wedge and then uh, cardiac port output and PAPI cardiac index SVR. So, um, so we can cat actually uh, smoothly categorize all of our patients, whether they are in pre-shock, hypotensive, normal tensive, LV dominant or RV dominant or biventricular shock. So it's actually useful in this uh, category of patients. 
So I would like to show a quick example of how to utilize PA catheter for treatment of heart failure. So by having the PCWP data and CPP data from the PA catheter, we could manage the patient more effectively. So this figure actually showing three different case scenarios of patient presenting with hypotension and decreased cardiac index despite inotropic support. So we can see here the, uh, the, the red, uh, red color is the patient one, it is the, my, my arrow shows the first starting point. So we can see this is a classic example of patient with primary left heart failure. So at a baseline, PCWP, uh, his wedge pressure is markedly elevated. Um, CVP is also elevated, you can see here. Um, and then cardiac output is reduced. With introduction of and progressively increase of using uh, percutaneous LVAT, such as Impella or um, impella, and then we can see here the cardiac opus increase, and then the patient came to the normal uh, wedge and also normalized in the CVP. And then I come to the second scenario, which is the green color. We can see the patient too. Also, same short markedly elevation in both uh, CVP and wedge pressure. And then we can see here by the use of uh, LVAT, uh, PLVAT support, there is also might decrease in um, wedge pressure and minimal changes of CPP. This hemodynamic patterns indicates that the patient is still in a, a volume overload state and requires intensification of diuretic therapy. And in this kind of patient, if um, diuretic therapy pharmacologically is unsuccessful, then the patient needs some form of renal replacement therapy. And then lastly, the patient, uh, three, uh, the patient third, uh, we know that the patient presents um, at with a pre predominant right-sided congestion, but also mild elevated in uh, PCWP. Pulmonary artery pressure um, in the, uh, show here is around maybe 20, 20 plus. And then uh, we can also see here that the uh, wedge is very high. We show we, if we, we calculate the PEPI, the PEPI will be very low, indicating a significant RV dysfunction. And we can see here, nevertheless, because the patient had reduced in cardiac index and elevated, slightly elevated wedge pressure, the implantation of LVAT might be reasonable in the first, first, first step. Um, however, as we know that after the introduction of VAT in this kind of patient, um, we can see the wedge pressure drop um, significantly, but then the CPP was increased further to the right. Um, which is just an indication that RV is not capable of keeping with the flow from the LVAT, uh, which we should initiate an RVAT in this kind of patient. Okay, so by, by all three examples, we can actually see there are several different therapeutic approach for uh, to each of these three patients, and PAC data was actually really important to, to decide which treatment that uh, should go um, based on the hemodynamic effectiveness, and we could decide upon therapy needed. And then for my last couple of slides, um, there are some criteria that were used to evaluate the presence of advanced heart failure and the needs for escalation of um, MCS therapy based on the current EST guidelines. So they show that there are these following criteria must be present despite optimal medical treatment. First is um, severe persistent NYHA class 3 or 4, and then severe cardiac dysfunction de um, defined by at least one of the, the following, which is uh, LVEF less than 30, isolated RV failure, non-operable valve or, or normality or congenital abnormalities, and then persistently high BNP or anti-pro-BNP, uh, and severe IV dysfunction with structural abnormalities. And also there is episode of pulmonary or systemic congestion requiring high dose of IV diuretics or diuretics combinations, or there is episode of low output requiring inotropes or vasoactive drugs or malignant arrhythmias. And then also lastly, severe impairment of exercise capacity with an ability to exercise or low six minute walk test distance less than 300 or peak VO2 less than 12 milli, uh, milliliters milliliter per kilogram per minute. And there are also ESC guidelines um, put uh, some of the, uh, the table here, the patient potentially eligible for implantation of that device, which is the patient with low EF and unable to exercise with low, again, low, low peak VO2 
and then more than three times of heart failure hospitalization in the previous 12 months, and then depending dependence of IV anotropic therapy or temporary medical, mechanical circular, circular support. And then also there is a noted progressive and organ dysfunction, which is worsening renal function or hepatic function, type 2 pulmonary hypertension, cardiac cachexia, or um, no, noted um, reduced perfusion and not inadequately, um, yeah, uh, basically hypoperfusion patients. Um, lastly, I would like to talk a bit on some risk course models that could be used to predict survival in patients with chronic heart failure. So in patients with heart failure of both reduced and preserved, the influences of readily available predictors of mortality can be quantified in integer score, which is accessible uh, by using this uh, magic score, which is we can access in www.heartfailurerisk.org. This study was done by, uh, I think, Pocock et al. in 2017, I think. Yeah. And then the score has a potential widespread of implementation in the clinical settings. Um, and then the, the second score is be done by the American, which is the Seattle Heart Failure Model, which also uh, widely accessible. That's the end of my presentation. I hope it's helpful. Thank you. Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Julian. Really sorry I joined you all a bit late. I was a bit caught up uh, at work. So I just wanted to say thank you, Novi. That was such a broad topic, and I think you really organized the subject very well, and you were talking about something that was really close to my heart. So I'm really excited to, to start the discussion. Um, I, perhaps I'll start off by asking uh, the audience that if you have any questions, uh, please put it in the, in the question box uh, so, so this can be a slightly more interactive but I think um, I think the main thing that I took away from your talk, which was really uh, informative, and I think was uh, which I think is really important, is that concept that you kept coming back about decongestion, and you alluded to it in the escape trial, for example, where you say congestion was a powerful predictor uh, of mortality compared to cardiac index, and you also talked about how, and in the and in that post hoc analysis as well, you could then then a four by four factorial graph, you could see very clearly that when you correct it for congestion, cardiac index lost its prognostic significance. Um, and coming back again to the slides before that, where you were talking about the DOS trial, where you're talking about the ADVO trial, I think for me, one of the main takeaways for the um, DOS trial really was that, you know, at 72 hours, 80% of your population remain congested, even with High dose IV diuretics or IV Lasix infusion, and you know the rehospitalization or death rate was fifty percent at two months, and that is a really terrible statistic, which sort of pushes us to believe that you need combination uh, uh, therapy. And you discussed a few of those, like uh, Advo and Chlorotic. So may I ask you, what is your what is your approach to patients who come in with acute heart failure, knowing the importance of decongestion, like re-emphasizing that concept of decongestion, how would you approach it? You know, uh, what combination do you like to consider upfront? Do you um, give LASIKs, do the monitoring of the urinary sodium, and then add the combination? Do you start combination upfront, and how do you choose them? Okay. Thanks, Julian, for a very nice uh, question. So yeah, um, I I do agree that the congestion is actually uh, very bad when it comes to heart failure. And we, as a heart failure cardiologist, we need to decongest our patient like ASAP. So um, there are actually some methods to decongest the patient. So in my way, um, so I actually more go, go towards the ESC position statements guideline, which I find actually very helpful during my clinical practice. Um, so when the, when the first came for acute patient heart failure, then I'll start by seeing the patient, whether the patient is last six na naive or not. If the patient is not naive, then I will give a uh, two times dose of the his regular uh, IV diuretics, uh, IV loop diuretics. I start the combination upfront actually, because in, in our hospital, we don't have urinary spot sodium and some patient, I don't know when it comes to Asia, I mean, in, in my hospital, they, they sometimes re refuse um, um, put on, polycatheter, so which is very difficult to monitor the unit output for every hour. So I asked the patient actually to write every time the patient goes to the toilet. And then, um, but if the patient is using a polycatheter, it's, it's easier for us to monitor. And we don't have urinary spot sodium, so we basically monitor urine output for 
the first six hours. And then um by and I start the combination up front. And usually the the, the medication that I start was a IV loop directly combined with MRA. Because um as we know the if the patient being too much because of the loop diuretic, the patient tend to be hypokalemic. So it's very difficult. Um, so sometimes I could start the combination with uh, MRA as uh, ASAP. And then um, I do not usually start with Tizide uh, on the first day. Uh, I'll give the loop diuretic combined with MRA. And then after six hours, then I see the, the urine output. If the urine output is still not good, then I'll increase the IV loop diuretics by two times. So like, um, and then I double the IV loop diuretics. And then I'll, I'll see the the electrolytes if the sodium is low then in our uh, in indonesia i mean you know my hospital we don't have metolazone so sometimes we need to use tizat diuretics but when it comes to tizat the patient tend to be more hypertensive compared to the using of metolazone since i don't have metolazone and sometimes tizat can cause a bp drop especially if bp is like 100 or 90s then i won't use tizat at all so i'll just add tolvaptan if the sodium is uh, less than 140 yeah cuz Tolvaptan is cheaper slightly in Indonesia compared to Singapore. I know that. <laughs> it's like $30. Oh. Yeah, it's like $28 dollars $28 uh, compared to like, I, I think $80 in Singapore. Is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. No, I thank, thank you. That's, that, that, that's a very good approach, I think, when you were saying combining it with MRA for that potassium uh, because you're worried about the hypokalemia. You're right. I'm quite I'm quite surprised to hear that it's cheaper. So for us, uh, we have a similar approach. I think our go-to drug for sequential blockade, nephron blockade, is metolazone. And I think we follow the US guys. I think we have a bit more experience with that drug. Uh, but yes, we're beginning to use tolaptin a bit more because of uh, from our Japanese colleagues uh, and their experience with it. Uh, of course, it's not licensed in uh, UK and the US. So when I discuss it with some of my UK colleagues, sometimes they kind of frown and be like, what is it? But some the, some hospitals have begun using it too. I'm also surprised it's uh, a bit cheaper in, in Indonesia. I didn't realize, it's, it's a barrier for us to use Tilbapton. Um, well, could I maybe open this up to the other panelists? How do you all normally approach sequential blockade in, uh, in Hong Kong and Malaysia? Uh, or maybe, maybe Derek first? Yeah, yeah, I... So furosemide with the uh, MRI is a quite common combination. So, but I, I think you um, both explained it very well. What I want to add to the decongestion part is that if um, after series of manipulation in the decongestion strategy, if it still doesn't work, still congested, I want to make sure the patient is supported for diuresis. Sometimes patient is having a sort of borderline blood pressure, but actually in cardiogenic shock. The patient is not supportive for diuresis, the urine will come out. And sometimes we have to make sure we don't miss the structural defects. For example, sometimes we miss very eccentric uh, mitral regurgitation, say for example, patient will still be congested all the time. So um, if patient, if you, after series of manipulation, if patient is still congested, do look into it and find the cause. Is it not supported? Um, is do we do we need to add sometimes we add a dose of level cement and the urine all come out and is the patient not supported is there a structural defects we've missed so that's something i want to add here Perfect, Derek, thank you and what about our malaysian colleagues so uh, hi uh right so for sequential nephron blockade I, i'm pretty sh uh, similar with regards to approaching it uh like um, how Singapore does it. We don't have metallism per se. Uh, we do have hydrochlorothiazide, uh, but in the guidelines, it is uh, one of those that you can use. So we do use hydrochlorothiazide on top of uh, fruzomide as well, infusion of boluses. Um, I would agree with Novi uh, that blood pressure can be a bit tricky. The hemodynamics can be a bit tricky if you use the thiazides uh, too quickly, too, 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 uh, too, high, uh, too high a dose. We do use MRAs for sure. Uh, the fact that it's a GDMT on top of, uh, you know, it can help with diuresis. But I would say that for MRAs, you really need a high dose to get that diuretic effect. And that's what I've personally seen uh, per se. So you can never really go up to 50 uh, and, uh, you know, sort of stay there really when it comes to diuresing a patient. We've just recently uh, gotten to about 10 in Malaysia approved, uh, but it is expensive. It's 70 ringgit uh, a pill which is seven lunches here. So quite tricky, quite tricky to use. But uh, if a patient can afford it, uh, it does work wonders, honestly. Um, yeah, uh, pretty, pretty standard, really. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I think we do have a question, so I might uh, direct this to Novi, if that's okay. So I think this is discussing that perhaps the dose trial might be relevant in this, and that is asking uh, in which condition a Lasix infusion might be better than a bolus. Uh, any lessons from the dose trial or any practical tips as to when an infusion might perform better than a bolus? Uh, hi, thank you for the question. It's such a very nice question because we ask this question all the time, when we should infuse the patient, when we should give IV bolus. So uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, my approach to this question will be based on my experience because um, as we know that by giving um, two times an, of IV bolus, we sometimes um, being like restricted by the BP of the patient. So sometimes if you give like 100 100 milligrams of, of IV Lasix by the BP is like only 90. Sometimes it's very difficult for you to like, okay, keep keep putting like the 100, 100 milligram three times a day. And then the, the nurse will keep on asking uh, every every six, every shift that the BP is 90. Can I sh can still I give the IV Lasix or not? So we know that we know that it's safe, but sometimes uh, when you keep on being asked, asked this question all the time, it's very like, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. So sometimes when the, the, so of course the first time I approach this is if the patient is not have have no previous episode of re diuretic re resistance previously, then I will give the IV boluses. But then if uh by after six hours, then I didn't see the, the prominent urine output which I sought for, then I will upgrade it to IV uh, continuous infusion. But if the patient start with the low lowest BP, like a system of, of uh, 90s, so I usually just give one dose of IV boluses and follow by IV continuous infusions. That's how uh, I, I I see uh, how I approach the patients. Um, how about you, Julian? <laughs> What's your uh, yours? Yeah, thank you. No, that's that's that's, that's a great approach. I think I, I I have a very similar approach as well. So my main limiting factor is really the blood pressure. I think whenever you have problems with diuretic resistance, you sort of think about it from a pathophysiological mechanism. The frumas, the frusamide is to get into the blood, so the oral absorption, which is always porous with frusamide, but with torsamide and stuff like that. To be filtered at the glomerulus, it's got to be transported to the luminal side of the tubule, get to the ascending loop of Henle, the loop diuretics, and it has to be, and the fluid that comes out then can't be reabsorbed at the distal tubule. Sometimes you think about issues like the um, albumin. If the albumin is low, will that affect the impact of its uh, ability to, to get into the kidney and stuff like that? But the, the other thing to remember about diuretics, or loop diuretics, of course, is that it has a very low ceiling effect. It's like the opposite of morphine that is very high ceiling. In fact, you achieve um, a, a, a cap in the efficacy of the diuretic at quite a low dose. So don't keep you know flogging the dead horse. Think of the sequential blockade uh, but coming back to the question of dose, uh, intermittent dosing versus continuous infusion, the main limitation for me tends to be uh, the blood pressure. If the chi can take uh, bolus dosing, I tend to go for bolus dosing just because infusion limits his ability, his mobility. Uh, so the, I, I tend to prefer it if the blood pressure can take it. But when you have diuretic resistance, I think that's the thought process you have as to why are they diuretic resistant and, you know, do you, do you want to come quickly to sequential blockade, which I think a lot of the panel here are saying that they sometimes might prefer that upfront. And, and that's that's what we do as well. Uh, right. So it's uh, 6.40. How are we doing for time? Do we have time for one more um, question? Right on time, actually, to transition okay. to Derek's um, talk. So um, I, I, I'll introduce Derek, is it, if that's okay? Perfect. Yeah. Right, Derek. So uh, the floor is yours. So Dr. Derek is from Hong Kong, a uh, cardiology specialist interested in both cardiomyopathy and also inherited cardiac conditions. And he'll be talking about comorbidities in heart failure. So the floor is yours, Derek. Oh, you're on mute, I think. Okay, you see my slides here? Good. Okay. All right. Okay. Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Derek from Hong Kong. Um, thank you for the kind invitation. And the only declaration I have for this talk is that this is going to be quite overwhelming. We have lots to go through, but I will try my best to highlight some of the important messages. Um, this talk will be heavily based on ESC 2021 heart failure guidelines and the 2023 focused update. This is the outline of my talk today. I first go through why do we need to know about comorbidities. And next, we focus on cardiovascular comorbidities. We will spend 10 minutes here and another 10 minutes on the non-cardiovascular comorbidities. 
So we would all recognize this algorithm in the management of heart failure. Just want to say comorbidities is in the guideline and it is central to heart failure management. But why are they important? They're important because they interfere with heart failure diagnosis. Sometimes it's difficult to differentiate whether it's heart failure or something else because they interfere with your heart failure treatment. For example, in cases of severe asthma or chronic kidney disease, or perhaps more importantly, because comorbidities worsen heart failure symptoms, increase hospitalizations and mortality. Okay, these are theories, but how important are they? I want to show you this first analysis from the German disease database, spent across 15 years looking at more than 320,000 patients with and without heart failure. What they found is a significant associations between heart failure and a wide range of comorbidities. And the stronger the association, the more prevalent you will find their coexistence. This is analysis from the RX study community published in circulation a few years ago. Basically, there are upward trends in the prevalence of most of the comorbidities in both half ref and half path across years. And this plot is important to show you how comorbidities affect your one year mortality. As you can see from the first row, in half path, for each additional comorbidity, you get an additional addition of 20% one year mortality. Whereas in half breath is 10% increment for each comorbidity. And the hazard ratios seem to increase over time as shown here. When we look at the reasons for hospitalizations in half breath and PEF, they are quite different. While half Heart failure remains the major cause of hospitalization in half breath. In half path, non heart failure causes constitute the major reason for hospitalization. And the causes of deaths are quite different between half path and breath as well. If we take an example to look at Emperor Reg and Emperor Preserved trials, while CV death remains the major cause of death in half breath, in this Emperor Preserved trial, you can see that this is not the case. You can see that the CV death only constitute half of the case of all cause mortality and in both groups. And on the other hand, which is even more alarming, is that with the use of SGLT2 inhibitor, despite a reduction in CV death, there is no reduction in all cause mortality, which means these patients are still dying from non cardiovascular causes. And the same pattern is also seen in DAPA HF and delivered trial for Depakifosin. For this reason, there is a growing interest trying to utilize these comorbidities as therapeutic targets to get an overall prognostic improvement in heart failure patients. When we see half path patients, apart from SGLT2 inhibitors, we should also tailor our approach to manage comorbidities. And I hope by now I'm able to convince you that comorbidities are prevalent, they are increasing, comorbidities worsen clinical outcomes, and it increase mortality, and comorbidities are central to heart failure management. But just in time to uh, go into the second part, cardiovascular comorbidities. This is a list of cardiovascular comorbidities listed in the ESC heart failure guidelines. And in the interest of time, I will mainly talk about atrial fibrillation and chronic coronary syndromes. And I will direct you who are interested to know more about the topics um, to our APSC EECC core cardiology review series, which is on the YouTube, as you, as you know from early start, for further uh, self-studies. When we look at recommendations for atrial fibrillation, number one, there is a strong recommendation for DOA both at VKAs, except in moderate to severe microstenosis or mechanical valves. This is an upgrade from last guideline to class 1A given the ample evidence showing a favorable efficacy and safety profiles. Number two, there is a class 2A indication for rate control with both beta blocker and digoxin. And compared with 2016, in fact, 2021 guideline, this is a downgrade of recommendation for beta blocker in heart failure with atrial fibrillation. Such downgrade, according to the guideline, stems from the fact that there is a lack of evidence of the prognostic benefits of beta blockers in patients with concomitant heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Also, the 
ideal target for rate control is still uncertain. But anyhow, beta blocker is still a safe option unless it causes bradycardia. For cardioversion, again, there is a class 1C evidence for urgent uh, ECV and unstable rapid ventricular rate and a class 2B indication for worsening the heart failure. What these recommendations have not changed. What has changed is the recommendation for AF ablation. Now it is upgraded to 2A recommendation for ablation in patients with worsening heart failure despite optimal medical treatment. Among all these changes, again, we are back to the very old question whether we should go for rate or rhythm. We learned from the very old affirm and staff trials that there is no convincing evidence, at least from the RCT point of view, that one strategy is definitely better than the other. But given the advancement in antiarrhythmics as well as ablation techniques, we probably should re revisit the issue. And I'm going to spend some time reviewing some of the recent landmark trials. In trying to make sense of these trials, the three questions we should be asking are, what if we focus primarily on heart failure population? Number two, what if we use ablation as the rhythm strategy? And number three, what if we start rhythm strategy earlier? In answering the first question, Castle AF is the first landmark trial comparing ablation with drug therapy in half ref. And ablation results in a 38% reduction in primary endpoint, 47% um, reduction in mortality, and 44% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So restoring and maintaining regular rhythm with ablation is really good for heart failure patients. Cabana take, takes a step further to compare ablation with drug therapy in a sort of more general atrial fibrillation population, not just heart failure. In short, it is a negative trial, but in its sub-analysis among heart failure subgroups, there, is a, there are signals of clinically important survival benefits, freedom from recurrence, and improvement in quality of life. So again, ablation is better than drug therapy in heart failure patients. While we have good data demonstrating efficacy of ablation in heart failure population, Amica gives us a glance from the other end. Amica recruited patients with more persistent and long-standing AF. Patients tend to have lower ejection fraction, and majority of them had uh, higher knee-heart classes. And the investigators compare, again, um, ablation versus drug therapy. And it was a negative trial. What it means is ablation might not work that well in long-standing atrial fibrillation and advanced heart failure patients. The third question would be, what if we start rhythm strategy earlier? And East AF Net 4 was published in 2020. It was terminated early due to efficacy. In this trial, they compare early rhythm control strategy within one year of onset with usual care, and it was positive trial. In the pre-specified sub-analysis in heart failure group, again, early rhythm control was shown to be superior to rate control. This analysis also included half ref and PEF, hence sharing a signal of benefit across the heart failure spectrum. In this trial, there is no demonstrable difference between ablation and antiarrhythmics. But again, this is not a dedicated trial for ablation since only 20% of the rhythm arm had ablation. Anyhow, um, it's a proof of concept that early rhythm strategy works. So my take on this would be ablation is better than drug in half breath, at least proven in the Castle AF trial. Ablation has not been shown to be better than drug in a sort of more general atrial fibrillation population as shown in Cabana trial. But rhythm strategy, if started early, is superior to usual care in AF population with concomitant CV conditions. This is shown in East AF Net 4 trial. And lastly, ablation is not better than drug and in long-standing atrial fibrillation and advanced heart failure from the Amica trial. I'm putting all these um, well, I should say, until we have further evidence on this aspect, it's still reasonable to individualize the rate and rhythm control strategies. You can consider starting with rate control, and if there is no symptom improvement or worsening a heart failure, then you consider rhythm control with special consideration for atrial fibrillation ablation. 
And right after the Heart Failure 2021 guideline was published, the APAF CRT trial was published right after. What we know before this trial is that patients with atrial fibrillation and heart failure, a strict and regular rate control with AV node ablation plus CRT has been shown to be superior to pharmacological rate control in reducing hospitalization. But this APAF CRT is the first trial demonstrating mortality benefits, and the trial was stopped for efficacy at interim analysis. Until we have further recommendations, I think the takeaway at this moment is both rate and rhythm control are reasonable strategies in heart failure. Medical therapy as, as first line is reasonable. If rate control is adopted, a strict resting rate control appears to be beneficial, especially with AV node ablation plus TRT. However, the optimal range has not been defined yet. And if rhythm control is adopted, perhaps an early rhythm strategy by ablation, for, for example, appears to be beneficial. So we switch gear to chronic coronary syndrome. This will be quite brief. Um, in patients with multivessel coronary artery disease and heart failure, what we learned from stitches is that CABG is probably still the way forward, if, if at all suitable. Whether it's viable or non-viable, people still benefit from complete revascularization. And CABG might offer greater completeness. And what we learned from the revived BCIS trial is that these patients do not have to rush in for revascularization. There is room for optimization of heart failure therapy first, and then perhaps bring, bring back the patient for discussion for optimal medical treatment versus CABG or high-risk PCI. At this juncture for chronic coronary syndrome, um, if revascularization is decided um, in this heart failure population, CABG should still be considered first choice if at all suitable. This is a 2A recommendation. And revascularization for persistent angina 2A indication. Pay attention that the current guideline has a 2B indication for revascularization in FREF with chronic coronary syndrome to improve outcomes. This has to be a careful evaluation, taking into account the presence of, for example, any left main or proximal LED lesions, comorbidities, life expectancies, etc. And it to be indication for PCI as alternative to CABG. Sorry. Now we move to the non-cardiovascular comorbidities. Again, um, not, not going to go through all of them but there are only those highlighted here. Um, we start with obesity. We, what we learned from data, um, that's the mechanism of HEFPEF is quite complex. Obesity is one of the very first phenotype observed in HEFPEF population. From preclinical data, we know that obesity is closely linked to heightened inflammation, fibrosis, and cell necrosis, which underlies the pathway to development of heart failure. In 2021 heart failure guideline, the only recommendation for management of obesity was caloric restriction and exercise training to improve exercise capacity and the quality of life. Until the idea of whether by reducing body fat composition, are we able to interrupt the pathophysiology and improve outcomes? So this was taken to a recent famous dap path trial, randomizing 500 half path patients with BMI 30 or above to receive one's weekly semaglutide. The dual primary endpoints were change in KCCQ and change in body weight. And the secondary endpoints include change in 60 minute walk distance, half daily events, and reduction in pro BMP. The results were encouraging with significant improvement across primary endpoints and secondary endpoints. And CRP as a marker of inflammation in this trial were also markedly reduced after treatment with semaglutide. So now we're going to have our first pharmacological agent for obesity. That is proven to improve heart failure symptoms and functional capacity. Iron deficiency, iron deficiency has been recognized as a prevalent comorbidity in heart failure, which contributes to exercise intolerance, poor quality of life and outcomes. There are solid evidence in the use of IV iron therapy in heart failure patients. So iron profile should be a mandatory test in all symptomatic heart failure patients 
and those who are anemic as well as those who are not. What we are interested in is the transferrin saturation less than 20%, same as those patients with chronic kidney disease. According to the 2021 guideline, uh, it's a class one indication for screening iron profile in all heart failure patients. If you screen, you can treat. If you don't screen, you cannot treat. And secondly, only IV uh, formulation works. After 2021 guideline, there was Ironman study published in 2022, similar population as the Affirm HF study, but different preparation using ferric um, dirisol models instead of carboxy models. Again, similar findings to Affirm um, HF, barely missed the statistical significance. However, we know that both Affirm HF and Ironman study were heavily affected by the COVID pandemic as shown by a COVID sensitivity analysis. And subsequently, two meta-analyses published in 2023 consistently showed that IV iron reduces risk of heart failure hospitalization with an rather inconclusive evidence on cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. After the meta-analysis, another trial, HeartFit, looks at ambulatory uh, HEFREF patients using ferric carboxy models given every six months as needed. The primary hierarchical uh, composite endpoint was only marginally improved. However, in this trial, the mean TSAT was higher than previous studies, which is 23%. And further sub-analysis found that the higher the TSAT value, the less benefit you obtain from IV iron. This brings us to the 2023 heart failure focus update. Again, a strong recommendation for IV iron in symptomatic HEFREF and HEFREF with IV iron deficiency to alleviate symptoms and improve quality of life. And a two-way recommendation for either carboxy models or durosol models to reduce heart failure hospitalization. My takeaway here is oral iron does not work. It has been shown in iron out half year trial. IV iron is safe. IV iron improves quality of life and functional capacity in HEFREF and REF with iron deficiency. Meta-analysis have shown unequivocal benefits in reducing heart failure hospitalization. And regular iron profile monitoring plus or minus replacement may be beneficial, especially for patients with lower T-set. Then we move on to CKD with specific focus on diabetic kidney disease, PKD. Uh, cardiovascular disease and kidney disease are often interlinked. They share similar pathophysiology, they share similar presentations, and they often coexist. CKD patients often died of cardiovascular causes. And the later the stage of CKD, the higher is the prevalence of CV death. And the CV mortality is much heightened when CKD and diabetes are combined, compared with absence of both or diabetes alone. While albuminuria is an excellent early marker for diabetic kidney disease, it's also an excellent marker for CV mortality risk. The higher the albuminuria, the higher is the CV mortality rate. But then, can we mitigate the risk here? We have our oldest friend is an ARP, proven to be useful in diabetic or non-diabetic kidney disease and cardiac disease. And then we have our recent old friend, SGLT2 inhibitors, coming out of the blue in half failure field, now widely used in different spectrum of disorders. Then we have GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, begin, receptor agonist uh, beginning at the uh, diabetic drug with weight loss property. Uh, recent trials have further demonstrated cardiovascular and kidney benefits, making this drug a very good potential option in DKD. And then MRAs. Deroidal MRA has been traditionally shown to benefit heart failure and CKD, but it is still rather underutilized due to concerns with hyperkalemia, particularly when using together with ACE, ARP, or ARNI, and also worries with worsening GFR. Non-steroidal MRA phenylalanine is more potent than ableronol and more selective than spironolactone. So they get the work done without causing much of the hormonal side effects. It has a balanced kidney and heart tissue distribution, stronger inhibition for inflammation and fibrosis compared with steroidal MRA, and it has less BP effect. Phenylalanine was well tolerated um, and was shown to be superior to steroidal MRA in this heart failure and CKD population. The largest data on CV outcome 
um, on finerenol in DKT patients comes from Fidelity pooled analysis. It combines data from Fidalio and Figaro. Fidalio is the first study focused primarily on kidney failure outcomes with secondary outcomes looking at cardiovascular events. And Figaro is a flip over, uh, similar design, except a broader GFR range, this time focusing primarily on CV events and secondary outcomes looking at kidney failure events. Basically, a flip over from Fidario. So Fidality is a pool analysis by combining these two similar designed trials. And to cut it short, um, Finaron was shown to reduce the CV composite outcome by 14%, reduce rate of doubling your creatinine by 23%, and effect persists even with SGLT2 inhibitor on board. So in 2023 guidelines for management of CVD in diabetes, diabetic patients, there is a class one recommendation for finerenol. In addition to A's and ARP in patients with all stages of diabetic kidney disease to reduce CV events and kidney failure. In 2023 focused heart failure guidelines, there is again a class 1A recommendation for patients with DMCKD to reduce risk of heart failure hospitalization. If we are to summarize how we mitigate CV risk in patients with DKD, we have three pillars, plus the emerging fourth pillars, GLP-1. We are eagerly awaiting the flow trial on GLP-1 in DKD patients. Some side effects to be mindful of, but tremendous clinical benefits, which you should not forget. From half failure comorbidities point of view, we should heavily target on DKD to bring about an overall diagnostic benefit. A few words on electrolytes. Um, hyperkalemia is not just present in CKD patients, but also frequently in patients with heart failure, particularly when we now start all four pillars together, which often adds hiccups to up titration of GDMT. But now effective drugs are available to safely reduce potassium level, allowing easier up titration of MRA or RNA, and can be used in longer term manner. These are sodium zirconium and pteroma, the more commonly used sodium poly, polystyrene, or we call it risonium, cannot be used long-term due to risk of bowel necrosis. Lastly, a few slides about cancer in heart failure. Yes, it lists out a table of cancer drugs that has the potential to cause heart failure or um, cardiotoxicity. Um, there is a whole guideline from ESC on cardio-oncology, very detailed explanation on pretreatment, risk assessment during on post-treatment monitoring and follow-up, especially tailored algorithm for each cancer therapeutics, and when to start cardioprotective treatments. I would strongly advise you to take a look at the guideline, the full guideline, if you are interested. In the interest of time, I will skip this today. Um, just go through the takeaways from um, the half year point of view, CV baseline risk assessment for all patients who are going to undergo um, cancer therapeutics with potential of cardiotoxicity. HFA ICOS risk assessment is advised. Cardioprotective strategies may be considered in high or very high risk group. Intensity of monitoring and follow-up uh, heavily based on the level of risk for cardiotoxicity. Treatment with ACE and ACE inhibitor and carbidolol should be started in patients who develop systolic dysfunction. Cancer survivors need to be periodically monitored in long term and GLS may be useful for early detection of cardiotoxicity. And with that, I would um, like to end my presentation here. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Derek. Um, I think you're spot on time as well. Uh, so we've got plenty of time for Q&A. Um, from the Q&A chat box, I can't see any new questions. So uh, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to just drop uh, a few in our Q&A chat box. Probably I'll start off with uh, the first question. And this is a question that is fairly general, so I'll probably open it up to everyone, uh, starting with Derek. When is it a no-no when, uh, when you're trying to consider an SGLT2 in the face of heart failure and diabetes? Is there any particular situation that you would think twice before starting an <coughs> SGLT2 in this day and age, seeing the um, amount of evidence that it has uh, collected? Really? Right. So SGLT2 inhibitors only been around for like 10 years. 
um, when it first came to clinical use, there was lots of concerns with its potential side effects. For example, urinary tract infections or ur genital urinary infections or ketoacidosis. We, we even worried about its use in acute setting to the point where we almost withheld SGLT2 inhibitor in every acute admission, right? And, but as our experience accumulates, we're getting more comfortable with this use. And it is actually a very tolerable and safe drug on top of its very wide spectrum of clinical benefits across different disease disciplines. Um, when we say no, no to SGLT2 inhibitor, I personally have a very high threshold of saying no to SGLT2 inhibitor only in situations with really concerns of serious complications such as history of serious genital urinary infections or serious ketoacidosis. Um, yeah, I, I, I personally have a, quite a high threshold to that, uh, to, to say no to SGLT2. I would love to hear what you think. Yeah, no, I probably want to ask um, the rest of the panelists, actually. Uh, Novi, um, is there any particular situation where you say, you know, uh, call the thing twice before starting the SGLT2? Um. No, actually, I'm quite confident to start AGLD2. Uh, but in maybe a little bit of a little bit of thinking, if the patient is um elderly and then sometimes have history of UTI, even though I know that SGLT2 doesn't really mean contributing to UTI, but in some some elderly patients, I find that by giving them SGLT2, some of them like complaining of like itchiness on the um, yeah, on that that area. So some that kind of those kind of patients need to educate them that by starting them on SGLT two, they need to really taking care of the hygiene. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I sort of agree with you as well. Um, there's a lot of well, there, there are papers now saying that it's fairly safe to use in frailer patients. But uh, personally, anecdotally, I have had my troubles with SGLT two in the elderly population. And the, the loss of weight just seems more pronounced in this particular group of patients as well. I'm not sure, Julian, uh, do you have any particular experiences or your thoughts? Um, thanks. Yeah, no, I think I think the overall risk appetite for using SGLT2 has sort of uh, uh, sort of you know improved uh, as we get more familiar with the drug. I mean, there were a lot of concerns about about acidosis and problems like that when you started the SGLT2 initially and. Clinical trials, even like the DARE-19, looking at, you know, dipaglifosin in an actively septic patient with COVID uh, in the ICU setting, for example, didn't suggest any a role of harm. So I think a lot of us, even in sick patients, the initiation of SGLT2 doesn't seem to be a problem. Um, the other thing I think about SGLT2 sometimes is, uh, as, as, as Novi was mentioning, risk of uncomplicated UTIs is 1.7%. So overall, very well-tolerated drug and very effective for a broad spectrum of cardiometabolic uh, profiles. So uh, we are quite aggressive with using SGLT2 on our side as well. Thanks. Yeah, 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 I agree. But you guys don't have an endocrinologist like mine, so sometimes it's tricky uh, handling dogma. But you know that's a whole different topic for a different day. Uh, we've actually got two questions, and one of them was actually on my list of questions. Uh, maybe a bit of a tricky one, but we'll start with Derek. Um, any opinion about the interestingly positive study of AF ablation in end-stage heart failure, which is the Castle uh, Heart TX study? I, I think everyone knows about this one because the graphs actually diverge really, really well from the start. Uh, are we, in, in a heart failure perspective, confident enough uh, using that finding in our clinical day-to-day -day practice? Derek? So you mean ablation in a uh, heart failure? Yep. So ablation, so especially I'm... in this end stage heart yeah. failure group patients, because you showed one study earlier that showed no benefit, and people don't quote that study as much as this study. To be fair, so any thoughts? Right, right, right. My my thoughts from is that um, um, the benefit from ablation compared with drug therapy comes from its superior, um, ability to maintain and restore sinus rhythm, right? So after all, it's not about doing the procedure that helps the patient, but it really the res restoration of sinus rhythm and maintenance of sinus rhythm, reduction in AF recurrence that really truly benefit the patient. So what I think from heart failure point of view is that is in patients with really advanced and heart failure, their atrial fibrillation are kind of difficult to restore. Um, and and it is more, much more difficult to maintain a sinus rhythm. And often these patients have breakthrough um, atrial fibrillation recurrence. So 
Um, what I think about the um, the um, trial is that I I I do think is uh, is um, on on certain aspect I think it makes sense that in really advanced heart failure ablation might not be able to show a really strong benefit over drug therapy. So that's my that's that's what I think. So right. See um. Uh, Julian, do you have any thoughts on that particular um, study? Yeah, so I I I I agree with uh, with uh, Derek Broughton speaking. I think a few things. So the first is you know the concept of rhythm control in uh, sorry as you know EF is a degenerative condition and anything that attempts to arrest a degenerative condition from further spiraling conceptually is very you know uh, intuitive to a lot of us and it makes sense. My problem with the Castle Heart Transplant. <laughs> trial is that the graphs diverged very spectacularly and Definitely. for a trial to have such a positive finding is something that makes me naturally a bit suspicious but i'm a bit of a pessimist i'm a bit of a skeptic i i, I think from a practical perspective it doesn't affect our management too much in the sense that you know sometimes when faced with a decision between vad transplant versus ef ablation i think many people will go on to opt for a slightly less invasive approach and you know try you 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 lose nothing by trying the inclusion criteria for castle heart transplant included all patients that were being considered for vad and transplant we know that the criteria for what is an advanced heart failure phenotype is something that differs from advanced heart failure centers. For example, if you look at, and even within the guidelines, if you look at the ESC versus the ACC criteria for what is an advanced heart failure phenotype, they don't agree on all the profiles. There are features in one that are absent in the other. So it's a mixed bag of patients to start with, mixed bag of pathologies. So to have a single treatment option in this very diverse group of you know undifferentiated patients and to say that it is so profoundly positive uh, you you sort of wonder if there's an alpha error. You sort of wonder if there is a you know if they're overcalling that treatment effect. It's intuitive. It makes sense. But I am naturally suspicious of a trial that's so positive and that was terminated early. We know all trials terminated early are prone to alpha errors. So I, I I would take it with a pinch of salt myself. But it is intuitive to me that it that it could be true. I don't think it is that it could possibly be that positive. Uh, but from a practical perspective, I don't think it makes a difference because for a lot of us, we just just try. You know, there's it's a less invasive option. Yeah. Uh, Novi, how 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 does that how has it changed your practice per se that particular trial? Do you know, oh, it doesn't change. I I agree with Julia because yeah. I trained in Singapore as well, so it doesn't really change much. Yeah, no, no, I concur because the, the one thing that worried me about that study was that number one, it was a single standard, like single standard study, but more importantly, it was done by the best of the best EPs. So, you know, uh, you, you gradually think, you know, are you going to get that kind of treatment elsewhere? You know, is this extrapolate, extrapolatable in the community, etc.? And the worry I have as well is, you know, this this perception that okay, uh, you're not really a candidate for VAT or transplant, etc. Oh, but I shouldn't exclude you for you know this invasive ablation when actually we don't know whether this data holds true. But you know that 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 again is a debate for another day, really. Uh, but uh, but good question from the uh from the audience. Uh, we have another question, and this is more of a Something I'd say more practical, day-to-day -day thing. Uh, what's your approach for managing heart failure in patients with severe renal impairment? And she's defined it as uh, EGFR of less than 30. Uh, I'll open up the floor to anyone, really. It's fine. Uh, yep. Well, I can start first. Um, for So I suppose uh, you're talking about um, FREF patients. So we can split it on... So with an EGFR of 30, I basically have um, no particular issues starting the, the four pillars um, in this range, but um, I would try to be uh, started at lower dose first, but I would, again, quite similar to other population, I would start off all together um, as long as the patient tolerates. So one one point to remind is that um, uh, in, the, in the past, we... Uh, I I, hope, I I know that some some people uh, when when the when patients creatinine clearance goes down a little bit, um, you try to take off the SGLT two, try to take off the intrastool, you try to take off the MRI. 
So what I see from half data perspective is that the um and in fact there are, are trials they um looking at the withdrawal of um ACE or ARP or ARNI after when the creatinine clearance go down, actually the patient do worse than giving giving the drug. So um the the creatinine clearance is uh for the commencement of these four of the of these pillars are are meant to be for commencement only. So even if the patient's creatinine clearance goes a little bit down, um, I will still keep these uh, drugs um, to 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 bring an overall benefit in, in kidney and cardiovascular. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. I think um, and you brought up a good point about the SGLT two inhibitors. We have seen it day in day out, but I think people are now more aware that you know if you have commenced it. Prior, if the EGFR does slip over time, you don't have to withdraw uh, the medication. I think that's a very important message that we need to get uh, across to people, really, in the audience. Um, I think that one, one, one question would be spironolactone. Your patient comes in EGFR less than 30 or aplanarone um, with HFREF. Do you start the spironolactone or aplanarone for the patient, Julian, in your practice? If the EGFR is less than 30, is it? If EGFR is less than 30, uh, have ref um, to start off with, and it's the first time you're seeing in clinic, would you consider spironolactone? Yeah, I don't have a hard answer for this. I think uh, they generally do, don't recommend starting a uh, spiral with EGFR close to less than 30. Uh, I have, uh, not for all, but I think it depends on the clinical situation, whether I think the person will benefit from it. I think this concept of, you know, the type 2 cardio-renal syndrome and this interaction between heart failure and renal failure is, is something that is of, of great interest. And I think it's something we should highlight a bit more, you know. Um, the majority of the time, for those of us who do a lot of swan ganses and for those of us who monitor hemodynamic profiling, the, we all know that the major cause of renal impairment in heart failure tends to be due to congestion, a reduction in transrenal perfusion pressure because of high renal venous pressure, we also know that um, you know renal dysfunction uh, behaves differently in heart failure. You know, I mean, um, Derek presented the data on uh, ACE and ARB for urinary ACR, uh, you know, albuminuria in diabetics, and there's definitely a benefit. We don't see that benefit in heart failure. And if you look at that review of uh, heart failure with CKD, ACE and ARBs cause that hemodynamic reduction in EGFR, but there is no improvement, the curves then fall in a parallel fashion. We believe that ARNI improves renal function in patients with albuminuria, but we, we are not sure. There's no strong data for that. There is some there is some exploratory data, but nothing strong. And we do know, of course, that Entresto increases albuminuria. It doesn't decrease it. And uh, albuminuria, of course, is both a marker, but also a mechanism of renal disease and renal dysfunction. So a lot of things that we are not very sure about, but we do know that renal dysfunction is the biggest predictor of poor outcome in heart failure. Of all the comorbidities, renal failure is one of, is the biggest. So it's something that we really need to to focus on a lot more. Sorry, bit of a no, 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 no. I think I think that's spot on. I think uh, a lot of key messages there, really. And um, great that you mentioned about irony. It allows me to segue a bit <clears throat> to the next question, which is tied to the question before. Probably want to uh, direct it to Novi. What is your take on the use of irony? in end-stage renal failure, so really the end of the spectrum of uh, kidney disease with heart failure. Um, clinically, right now, your day-to-day -day practice, how do you sort of handle it? Yeah, that's a really, really tough question. Again, I, as um, previously mentioned by Julian as well, you know, this CKD patient is uh, very difficult to to manage, especially when it comes to heart failure and the choice of medication. I tend to a little bit more uh, going back to giving certain medication, especially if the patient is not yet on on undergoing dialysis. Um, if the patient is like end stage CKD and not going into dialysis, and the patient like having persistent hyperkalemia and all this kind of, um, I mean, if if you are less than fifteen, then I probably won't start like top from start Arni. Um, um, but in but generally. But in in some patient, uh, the patient is already like CKD previously. Then I still continue on the the ACE or ARPs or ARNI in the, the, those kind of patient. Unless the there is also like significant hyperkalemia, then I need to to withdraw the medications. 
yeah it's really a uh, really a tough uh, tough um tough practice and really you really need to monitor this kind of patient more closely you cannot like say okay you give you this and then you come back three, another three months and probably the patient will go on dialysis and then having a uh, hyperkalemia or this kind of problem yeah yeah i mean correct me if i'm wrong guys um i think there there might be a study uh, soon for RNA in end stage renal failure. Not too sure personally, but I do know that uh, in the journal cardiac uh, journal of cardiac failure by the Heart Failure Society of America, they, they had a nice article write up on how you use RNA in certain situations. And for end stage renal failure, there were some recommendations here and there. I think the benefit was really anti pro BNP reduction. Now, whether that translates into you know harder endpoints clinically, I'm not. I'm not too sure. What. what Derek, uh, Julian, what are your takes on RNA and end stage renal failure? Uh, I, I'm happy to go first if that's okay. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, go ahead. So I think I think it's difficult. Uh, is the answer uh, we we don't know that we need more data. We know that people with end stage renal failure behave differently. You know, um, end stage renal failure there doesn't seem to be any benefit of warfarin in atrial fibrillation. End stage renal failure with ischemic heart disease there doesn't seem to be as much of a benefit with statin. In fact, there seems to be signal of harm in terms of neurological events. So they are a different bag of patients. We extrapolate a lot, but I think a lot of the time with end-stage renal failure, we begin to see that, you know, you can't, you, a lot of those extrapolations might not necessarily bear true. So I do agree with Novi. You know, it's a, we always say case by case and we're not very sure. And I think uh, a lot of the time it's, it's a bit of an art in, in, in this application. Uh, I, I do agree in the sense that if the patient was already on an ANI, I might be slow to withdraw it. Uh, if they want ACE or ARB, I may, I, I may just carry on with that uh, therapeutic drug as well. But it is more of a therapeutic inertia rather than for a good clinical indication. <laughs> <laughs> and Derek, uh, yeah. any last thoughts? Yeah, quite quite, quite the same. Um, if the patient is already on ACE or ARNI, I probably I'll still observe it. I, I probably wouldn't withdraw it. But if the patient is not on any any of those, I might be hesitate. I might be a bit hesitant to start it, given we don't have much evidence in this area. Um, if you're going to start, please look after the ICM level. Yeah. yeah. That's a great message to end uh, the session, really. Thank you very much, guys, for helping panel and uh, for, helping, uh, for helping deliver such wonderful talks uh, for this particular episode. Um, Thank you very much to the audience as well for tuning in. I know we're running just a bit late, but uh, there were some key messages there that you know I thought would be fairly important to get across. So hopefully people take home uh, those messages and uh, it really does help with your clinical practice now. Just a final shout out. Our episode 7 will be on the 13th of March and it's a bit of a cardiology popery of channelopathies, uh, myocardial diseases and uh, cardiovascular surgery, etc. So please tune in and I think uh, final words really uh, from everyone. Uh, Novi? Um, well, <laughs> I don't much to say but really uh, when it comes to heart failure, you need to decongest faster. <laughs> That's ah, what I think. But um. But yeah, there's a little bit of art here and there, and really need, you really need to really um see the patient clinically rather than like judging, you you know like going all through the guidelines and putting all the medication without um assessing all the big uh, each of the patient's condition and clinical co comorbidities. Yeah. Uh, Derek or Julian. Um. So, I would say five ten years ago, um, comorbidities in heart failure would be a knowledge thing in your head. But nowadays in this era, it would be quite a practical thing because now we have lots of gears to target those comorbidities. Please don't miss those comorbidities because by targeting the comorbidities, you can get an overall prognostic benefit in this population. Particularly in HFPEP, when we are very short of any strong yes. therapeutic right, options, comorbidities is really a strong target to head after. And Julian, my co-chair, anything okay that's great i don't really have too much more to add except to say i think the, my main takeaway from the excellent excellent talks today is that if you look at every single aspect of the disease the field just moves so quickly there's so many trials coming out there's so much knowledge to go through and sometimes you know it, please if there are any issues there's always uh 
people to ask for help and for people to discuss. And even amongst us, you can see sometimes we don't approach the same problem in the same way. So always good to 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 discuss these cases. Uh, the, the the field moves very quickly. Um, but otherwise, thanks for, to, for the great session and excellent talks. Thanks. All right. Okay, again, thank you guys um, very much. I uh, will see you in the next episode on the 13th of March and happy Chinese New Year to all those celebrating as well. Thank you. Right. Bye, Chinese guys. New Year. Happy New Year. Bye. 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 Bye.